Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Faris Haddad. It's my great honor to introduce you, uh, introduce everyone to you this evening. This is the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health Grand Round, uh, entitled Optimizing Performance, Success for Our Athletes, Health for the Nation. Um, our hope is for the next hour to introduce you to some of the aspects that the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health is delivering and hoping to deliver over the next few years. We have four excellent speakers uh, for you, which we'll introduce as they come along, and then some Q&A time uh, at the end before we go to the South Cloisters for drinks at uh, 7.30. Uh, we've had a, a big day here in introducing the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health and launching the National Center, so th this really is a, an ideal event to top it off at the end of the day. And it's, it's a great honor to have Sir Professor John Took with us this evening, the Vice Provost for Health, who I hope is going to say a, a few words uh, before we start. Faraz, thank you very much indeed. It's uh, a real pleasure on behalf of uh, UCL uh, and the School of Life and Medical Sciences to recognize the tremendous progress that the Institute of Sports, Exercise and Health has made and to be with you here tonight um, following uh, the formation of the National Center for Sports uh, and Exercise Medicine. Um, when I reflect on these achievements in very short order, uh, I'm reminded of some work which was recently done by RAND Europe, which examined the determinants of excellence and impact in terms of health science. And there are a number of features. The first is interdisciplinarity, bringing different disciplines together to common purpose. The second was inter-institutional collaboration. The third was co-location, putting basic scientists and more applied scientists together. And of course you have that in your new facility in 170 Tottenham Court Road. You exhibit those three features very fully and I think that really augurs well for the success uh, of this enterprise. But there are, there are two or three other determinants that I'd like to add. Uh, first uh, amongst those is stakeholder engagement and we have many stakeholders and interested parties here this evening. Uh, second is that underestimated quality, I suspect both in sport and, but certainly in acadi academic endeavour, which is resilience, and I know you've had to work hard to end up uh, where you are. But third, and perhaps most important of all, uh, is leadership. Leadership exhibited through you, Faraz, through uh, Monty Mythe and through Hugh Montgomery uh, and others that have made this uh, progress uh, a reality. So delighted to be here to um, record our commitment uh, at UCL level uh, to these enterprises and, and I'm sure you have uh, a very exciting evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, we'll uh, We'll start the uh, lectures with uh, Professor Hugh Montgomery, who really needs no introduction. Hugh has had a stellar academic career. He's a professor of intensive care medicine. He's an active clinician, a very active researcher in the sport and exercise field, and he's made a massive contribution in the genetics of performance. And he's going to share with us some thoughts and some of his current research. Hugh. Thanks very much, Faris. See if that's me. Well, that's Mike's. Oh, don't want to use Mike's talk. Uh, Faris, thanks very much, um, Sir John. Thank you for your kind words. Um, this is 10 minutes, and I can't gallop through the whole of uh, genetic, genetics and physical performance in 10 minutes, uh, but I can give it a damn good try. <laughs> as human beings, what defines you as human is your genome, and you have somewhere in the region of 16 to 20,000 genes, depending on how you want to define a gene, comprising uh, an diploid genome, around 6 billion uh, base pairs. And that's what makes you human. But of course, we are all different from one another. We are not uh, genomic clones. We don't all look and behave the same. And part of that difference is down to genetics. You, these are perhaps slightly spurious, but certainly in terms of exome sequencing, if you look at the similarities between humans and lower primates, we share around 96% of that genome. 
it's, uh, you can play all sorts of games. We share around 60% of our genome with a fruit fly and around 54% with a banana. <laughs> um, and you can usually tell you the difference between your colleagues and fruit. Sometimes it's <laughs> harder than others. But if that defines the difference between species, um, the differences between us as humans is really a great deal smaller. And within this room, um, if you look at your next door neighbor, unless you're related to them, there'll be less than 1% of your genome that differentiates you from your next door neighbor in this room. Is it just the genes? Well, quite evidently not. It's both nature and nurture. It's the interaction of the complex environment from in utero to what you expose yourself to in life with your genomic propensity that determines the way you are. And you can see that even simply in this. These are, believe it or not, identical twins. They have an identical genome. But in utero, one of them has been starved of circulation and the other has had a much more luxuriant circulation. And the resulting phenotype is really very different. And it turns out that somewhere in the region of 30 upwards percent of the variation across any phenotype in this room, whether it's your propensity to smoke cigarettes or how many, whether you drink alcohol and how much, let alone height and so forth, at least 30% of that variation will be genetic in origin. And that certainly applies too to many performance phenotypes, whether it ranges from lean muscle mass, your ability just to stand with both feet on the floor and jump high, or even your reaction time. A generous proportion of each of those, the variance, is down to the genes that you carry. And upon that genetic propensity to be able to do something, there's also a strong genetic influence even on your wish to take part. So whilst that's not denigrating the effects of environment and politics in encouraging people to exercise, those of us that choose to take stairs rather than lifts, those of us that choose to take a walk after a meal, the people you know that might drive round and round the block waiting for parking space outside a a shop or prepared to park up the road 200 metres away, a lot of these behaviours are known to be strongly genetically influenced. And indeed, um, there have now been three studies confirming at least two of these genes, which are hypothalamic and seem to be involved in what you might broadly call energy balance, energy homeostasis. So some people are genetically predisposed to wish to take more exercise, and some are predisposed to be more capable of doing that. The candidate we've worked on forever, um, and for those of you that work with me, you can switch off now because you'll know these data. This is a, a gene, the angiotensin converting enzyme gene. It has a great deal of polymorphic variation. It's around 110 variants in the gene. This is the most informative. It's the presence or absence of a little extra chunk of DNA. And if you have the extra bit in, you have low ACE levels. And because the alleles are equally frequent, a quarter of you in this room have low ACE activity with two I variants. Half of you have an iron deer in the middle and the range 25% of you, like me, have two D versions and have high ACE activity. And we showed as early ago as 1994 that these genes strongly influenced heart growth in response to exercise. This work in military recruits, and we've done this study now three times to be sure we were right, but there's very substantial difference in growth of the left ventricle, the high ACE genotype quarter of the population, growing their heart around threefold more than those of you in the audience who are low ACE genotypes, if one does the same physical training. We know that it affects skeletal muscle efficiency. So if you measure this, uh, measure delta efficiency, and this was work actually that was uh, first authored by Alan Williams, who's in this audience. Delta efficiency, uh, external work performed compared to internal work, roughly 25% efficiency prior to military recruit training. But the percentage change in that with training very substantially more for the IIs, and we DDs at the end are statistically a little worse than we were before we even joined the army, if we did. And that translates, as you might expect, into differences in human physical performance. So this was simple work. Uh, on the y-axis is this time at which one could do a simple performance. This was heels, bums, backs to the wall, 15 kilo barbell on the thighs. Every time the metronome goes ping, lift it up. Every time the metronome goes ping, it goes down. And when you can't keep up, uh, then you're out, and the number of seconds are counted. The first bar, which is here, here, and here in each case, is prior to training. You'll see that everyone, independent of genotype, goes on for around 100 seconds. At six weeks of training, which is the middle bar, the IIs have roared away with an extra minute of exercise time, <coughs> and by the end of training, they've doubled their exercise time, and we DDs, statistically, are no better at the end of training than we were to start with. 
These are data for, from, uh, that we published with Richard Budget, who was here earlier today from the British Olympic Association, looking at distance run. And if one looks at the I allele frequency, which I've said is roughly 50-50 or 0.5, you'll see that the allele frequency rises in elite runners as the distance they run increases. So the I allele seems to be associated with propensity for, to elite performance in fatigue-resistant or endurance-dependent performance. And if that happens, importantly, at sea level, it sure as hell happens in mountaineers. These are 1906 UK controls, which are the same as you, roughly 25% II, 25% DD. But look at the mountaineers. There's great cramming over towards the prevalence of the II genotype and, and excess of the I allele. And that translates into simple, almost Darwinian uh, findings. Uh, George Ostianos, um, one of our PhD students, sat in the Goute hut on Mont Blanc, and people headed for the summit, and he took some DNA before they left, and when they came back, he said, did you get to the top or didn't you? And you can see all the IIs get to the top, and somewhere around 12% of the DDs don't. And you can see the same effects in short-term ascents of Kilimanjaro, for instance, where um, the strongest determined it is not um, whether you're, you're sort of got grit and determination. It's just whether you've got the right genes. So the IL is associated with endurance performance, but if you think about it, there's a deficiency of the ILs in the sprinters. If you look at the D allele frequency, you see the opposite. There's an excess of the D allele, and that's because the D allele is associated with advantage in strength performance and sprint. So you not only see this in sprinters, you see it, for instance, in swimmers, because swimming, even at 400 metres, is largely a power and sprint-related sport. So again, the controls, roughly 25, 50, 25. And again, this crunch towards, in this case, the D allele amongst swimmers. And I think we'll flick through. I think I might have the Russians there, where you see the same effect in the Russians for short and long-distance swimming. Now, just to close out then, um, this is all pruriently very interesting. And uh, it's been very productive and has probably kept me employed at UCL. But there are other reasons for taking interest other than just being able to pay one's mortgage. And that's because many of us in this room are clinicians. And the people um, that I try and look after, and that Mike Grocott, who speaks after me, look after, and Monty Mythen, are critically ill. These patients have um, respiratory distress syndrome, where their lungs essentially flood with fluid, they become profoundly short of oxygen, and they're in for the world's longest ultra-distance race upon which their lives depend. And patients quite often die from this. Around a quarter of them will die. And when they survive, when we didn't expect them to, we have long interrogations about, well, after we've gone, gone drunk a lot and congratulated ourselves on what fantastic clinicians we are, we then have a post-mortem about what we did right. And when a young person dies that really shouldn't have done and we're feeling terrible, we have a long post-mortem about what we did wrong. And in fact, if you look at these data, it, there's a five-fold difference in mortality across just these genotypes, which, sad to say, as long as I'm not grossly incompetent, trumps pretty much anything I could do. And it opens up, of course, the potential for therapeutic intervention. Low ACE activity people do better. And that's something that Mike and I are exploring at the moment, is delivering ACE inhibition safely to such patients. We know it also applies to meningococcal disease, the sort of disease you read about in the papers in the winter where children die. A study we did with Liverpool looking at children coming in. Some of them are left on the ward because they look pretty much all right. Some of them make it to PICU, Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, and some of them there die. And you'll see the percentage of DD genotype uh, in each of those groups. There's this, again, a very strong association with poor outcome and death. So that's where I'm going to finish. Um, this sort of work is important. It's not just important to elite athletes. It's not just important to helping define gold middle winners, perhaps select them or train them differently. This sort of work has absolute direct relevance to small children, premature babies, or to you or I when we become ill or our, patient, uh, our parents. And that's the reason why I think that we should be focusing on the sports and exercise agenda. It has direct relevance outside the Olympics. And just to finish then in terms of is it nature or nurture, which was how we started, um, just to say that great athletes are both born and made. Thanks very much. Thank Hugh, that's outstanding. We'll have some time for questions at the end.
Uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Mike Grocott, who's already been uh, briefly alluded to a moment ago. Mike is a professor of intensive care medicine. He's also uh, the founder and uh, leader of the Caldwell Everest Ext Extreme Everest Ex Expedition and leading another exhibition, ex expedition, I've lost it. Uh, next, next year, Mike's made a massive translational research contribution in that arena, which is very relevant to sport and to intensive care. And he's gonna talk to us about Everest learning from extreme environments. Mike. Thank you very much, um, Faris, for the very kind introduction. Uh, the other Mike and I were just sitting there feeling slightly rueful as, as some kind of sacrificial sandwich between um, Sir Clive and Hugh, who are both magnificent performers uh, and ourselves, but we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, hopefully some slides will come up in a moment. How's that? So, the, Kevin Fong and I, uh, almost exactly 12 years ago, stood in this room and uh, started the UCL Centre for uh, Altitude, Space and Extreme Environment Medicine. And since then, it's thrived, and along with uh, Hugh, Monty Mythe and Dan Martin, uh, Kay Mitchell and Denny Levitt, we've, we've managed to, uh, and many others, we've managed to teach a BSc course. We've had uh, MSc students, postgraduate students, and, and a number of research themes in different extreme environments. But today I'm going to focus on uh, altitude in particular, and specifically the Caldwell Extreme Everest study, uh, which we conducted in 2007. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why we went to Everest and then have a brief jog through some of the important results. So why go to, to Everest? The two principal reasons were that, uh, from our perspective, we uh, feel that it's a useful model for critical illness. And Hugh set me up very nicely with the, uh, the links between ACE genotype and uh, performance, and specifically performance at altitude and ACE genotype in uh, ARDS. Uh, but there are other, there are other parallels, uh, and hypoxia, and hypoxia is what you have at altitude, as the, the air thins and there's less oxygen. Hypoxia, along with inflammation, are probably our two cardinal pathophysiological processes, the two things that cause harm in critically ill patients. The second reason we went there was that we felt there was some uh, unfinished business in terms of altitude research, and that the classical oxygen flux model of how humans adapt to high altitude really didn't explain uh, what we see in terms of the dramatic differences in performance between individuals. So, uh, critical illness, we could study patients, but one of the problems with patients is they're such a wildly mixed group that it's very difficult to separate any single factor uh, from the, the soup of things that are going on. So we took the alternative approach of looking at healthy volunteers, whether the single change was their exposure to altitude and specifically their exposure to uh, hypoxia. The problem that I alluded to in the altitude explanations is this uh, is something that's probably very counterintuitive from a sports perspective, and that's the fact that oxygen convection does not equal performance. So you'd expect, and, and the, what the books imply is that the people who are most able to uh, adapt and improve their convection of oxygen down towards the tissues are the ones that would do, uh, do the best, but it's simply untrue. Probably the best example is these two individuals, Reinhold Mesner and Peter Habler, the first to summit Everest without supplemental oxygen. Uh, they've been very extensively studied. This is VO2 max data. Uh, they are two of the subjects highlighted by the red box, and the green box are uh, sedentary Swiss couch potatoes. Uh, so very unremarkable physiologically, but extraordinary in their ability to perform at altitude. This is some of our data from uh, 2007, a paper which was notable for the highest measurement of oxygen in terms of altitude close to the summit of Everest, but provides a useful uh, reminder that in well-adapted individuals at altitude, their oxygen content, the amount of oxygen being carried around in the blood, is actually pretty much the same as it is at sea level. So there's plenty of oxygen going around. So elite climbers, there's no obvious explanation why they, from simple physiology, why they succeed. And actually all of us, when we've had time to adapt, have plenty of oxygen. So it's not simply about classic oxygen delivery. So what we set out to do was test uh, one particular hypothesis, which led to several others, which was that, uh, that none of the changes that we saw at altitude would be explained by changes in oxygen content or oxygen delivery. And therefore we had needed some alternative mechanisms, and specifically we wanted to focus on the function of the microcirculation, the very small blood vessels that... Uh, are responsible for getting oxygen and other nutrients from the larger blood vessels down to the tissues. Uh, the possibility that there was an improvement in efficiency, 
So uh, almost you get more miles per gallon, more ATP per unit of oxygen metabolized, and there's, there's plenty of basic science work which suggests that that's possible, or that there were uh, alternative mitochondrial ad adaptations. And as I've mentioned, this was underpinning a translational agenda, and this is, uh, I guess, the model that we use. So we measure physiological variables at altitude, both at rest and under the perturbation of exercise to uh, volitional maximum. And then combining that with plasma biomarker data and genetic data, and Hughes alluded to some of that, we're looking for a signature of those who are adapting well and those who are adapting badly. And that, in turn, can lead to either candidate biomarkers for prognostication, risk stratification, or even more intriguingly, to candidate mechanisms, which we can then empirically test in a variety of other models. So we have a very pleasant working environment. Uh, we took... Uh, more than 200 healthy volunteers for a three-week trip to Everest base camp, uh, and uh, of the 60 investigators, 24 of them followed the same trek a little bit more slowly, uh, and then uh, 15 of those ascended higher on the mountain, some of them uh, right up to the summit. This is a uh, figure describing the ascent profile, so the trek is going a little bit quicker, and some of the differences that that created were very uh, intriguing. The climb is a little bit slower, and then some initial testing, followed by, in some cases, an ascent to the summit. So this was the ultimate destination, and you can see in the foreground our two laboratory tents, and in the background the medical and logistics tent, and this is what it looked like inside. And we could do almost anything there that we can do at sea level. With the, I think the only exception was the uh, functional MRI. It's difficult to get a magnet up there. But otherwise, 240 volt AC electricity, any technology that you care to mention in a sea level laboratory. So I'm now going to take you on a, on a rapid jog through the highlights of the data, really focusing on the... Uh, the key elements uh, of, of, uh, of hypoxic adaptation. So the first thing is to emphasize the point that I made that, and this is change in oxygen consumption versus change in oxygen content, there's absolutely no relationship. It's completely counterintuitive to an exercise audience. It's what we kind of knew before we went, although the data was relatively thin. This is data in, uh, in this particular slide, 148 subjects, but it's consistent across all the comparisons that we've looked at. So there must be something else explaining the substantial increases, the substantial variability that you see between people from the mesners who can reach the summit of Everest without supplemental oxygen to the individuals who will struggle to get to Everest base camp 4,000 metres lower. One of our primary, our, our key hypothesis that we, we, before we went, we said, we're sure this is going to be the case. Uh, we were completely wrong. So there was absolutely no change in efficiency uh, and and I'll, I won't go into the nuances of measurement here, but es essentially, if you measure it in steady state, you can look at oxygen ATP relationships in the cell. No change at all. But economy, which is measured the same thing measured on a ramp, changes substantially. And to cut a long story short, that can only be explained by changes in so-called oxygen kinetics, the speed at which oxygen is transiting through the body from the mouth down towards the cells. Why might that be? Well, uh, Dan Martin's uh, studies very elegantly showed, and I'm just going to flip back so you get that first video, very elegantly showed that the microcirculation, for some reason the first one is not flagging up, is, uh, this is sea level, this is uh, 6,400 metres, the microcirculation at altitude is dramatically dysfunctional. There's a very slow flow, and we'd have expected to see a much more rapid flow. Why might that be? Well, initially we were unsure. It's completely unrelated to hematocrit, which is an obvious candidate uh, explanatory mechanism. But it turned out when we started to look at uh, nitric oxide and nitric o nitrogen oxide metabolism that not only were they dramatically deranged, but those derangements, uh, and you can see here uh, nitrate and blood flow in small blood vessels, small, or very small and medium-sized <coughs> small blood vessels, uh, that they, the nitrogen oxide changes are related to, and we can't be know for sure whether that's causal, but they, they're related to the changes in blood flow. And, and those who have the higher levels of nitrogen oxides seem to be doing better uh, at altitude. We also took muscle biopsies, and we showed what many have shown before, that there's loss of mitochondria at altitude. So these muscle biopsies taken in situ at altitude. Loss of mitochondria at altitude compared to at sea level. But what we showed that was novel is that there are changes in mitochondrial proteins, so you can see here changes in complex 1 and complex 4, and some of the mitochondrial biogenesis factors clearly pointing to cellular energetic adaptation, and that was confirmed by the MRI data that we have from before and after, so immediately before people, shortly before people left and immediately they returned, and this is in collaboration with 
uh, Kieran Clark in Oxford, uh, clear uh, decrements in this, in this case, fossil creatine and ATP ratio, but alterations in cellular energetics. We saw similar things in skeletal muscle, but that's not what I'm showing you here. This is one of the intriguing findings that, that did surprise us a little. This is trekkers versus climbers before we go, and their uh, intracellular cytosolic inorganic phosphate are different. And there were several variables for which that was true. So our, before we expose them to altitude, our trekkers and our base camp staff and our climbers stratified for a number of variables. And this has raised the intriguing possibility, either very simply they, they've selected themselves, they've gone to altitude, they've gotten well, so they keep going back, so they're a self-selected group, or it's a consequence of that repeated exposure to altitude. So they're imprinted, and we clearly in epigenetics have a potential mechanism whereby that might occur. So to summarise the science, uh, as we knew before, the oxygen changes, the oxygen consumption changes are not explained by oxygen delivery. Uh, efficiency doesn't change, but the kinetics do, and that's probably explained by the microcirculation, the very smallest blood vessels. Uh, that in turn may be explained by nitrogen oxide metabolism. There's clear uh, significant changes in cellular mitochondrial uh, regulation, and we've got baseline differences that are suggested of epigenetics. So where does that take us clinically? Well, a, a whole host of different avenues. Uh, we've started looking at this idea of permissive hypoxemia. Can we lower the oxygen level that we're giving to some of our patients because we can work out in advance that they're likely to tolerate it and we can monitor them for any harm that, that might cause? We're looking at nitrogen oxides as a therapy uh, for cellular hypoxia and se sepsis. Uh, Hugh's doing a lot of work on skeletal muscle harm and recovery in, cl in critical illness, closely related to this. We're looking at skeletal muscle harm and recovery, uh, which Monty's already alluded to, following neoadjuvant chemotherapy. We're obviously very intrigued by the epigenetic basis of susceptibility to critical illness in the same way that you, we think we're seeing at altitude. And then there's some intriguing ideas about how, how the pulmonary venous blood flow may actually be acting as a driver for organ dysfunction. Where do we go forward? Well. Uh, Extreme Everest uh, has become a uh, multi-centre international collaboration involving now also University of Southampton and Duke University uh, in uh, North Carolina and the United States. And we have three separate strands of research, the clinical translational work, which I've alluded to already, uh, field environment studies with uh, Dan Martin leading uh, Extreme Everest 2 next year, focusing on Sherpa uh, adaptation and twins and, and the uh, epigenetic changes that you can identify in, in a large twin population. Uh, and then in addition, we're doing uh, some small focused chamber and tent studies, uh, and in particularly in collaboration with, our, uh, with the chamber team in Duke. So I can't close without acknowledging the very generous funders without whom this would not have been possible, and of course the investigators, treppers and sherpers, uh, and I'll leave you with um, a nice picture of UCL on top of the world. Outstanding work, Mike. It's, uh, we'll move on to the, the other mic now. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mike Loosemore is a leader in sport and exercise medicine. He's a consultant here at UCH and with the English Institute of Sport. He has had a number of leadership roles in sport and exercise medicine over the years, but he's currently the lead for exercise as medicine in the UK, and he's going to share with us the, the role of exercise uh, move, moving forward. Exercise as medicine, Mike. Thanks. Different pointer. Okay, well, I, I, I was told I had uh, eight minutes uh, to change your lives, so um, let's give it a, let's give it the best shot. <coughs> My talk involves uh, some of the genetic work that Hugh's been talking about, and also some of the adaptive work that Mike was talking about. So, genetics, evolution. Well, we're familiar with this stage, and, and I think everybody is now familiar with this stage here. Uh, we all spend most of our days, I hope I'm not just speaking for myself, uh, crouched over a computer. So, is this how we should be? Well, probably not. Uh, we know that uh, we are designed to be endurance hunters. There's only two mammals that actually have endurance, and that, that's uh, humans and horses. And humans have got better endurance than horses. <coughs> And there's certainly evidence from uh, Neolithic times of 
big animals having butchery marks on them. And so what you do is you wait till the heat of the day, you start chasing your big animal, and you keep chasing it, and you keep chasing it, and you keep chasing it, and it drops down dead with heat stroke, and you cut its throat, and you eat it. It's very easy. That's really what we're designed to do. We're not designed to sit here listening to me or sitting at a computer. We're designed to be out chasing animals down. So if we look at, uh, we know there's a big problem with obesity and there's a big problem in America. Uh, but if you look at the Amish community in the States, uh, if you know the Amish community in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, where they uh, shun mechanical aids, um, they looked at men and none of them were obese. None of them. They looked at women and 9% were obese only against 30% of the normal population. If you look about recommended levels of activity, you can see that even the young are not reaching the recommended levels of activity and that falls off as you get older. Compared to 1980, we now travel 25% less under our own steam, watch twice as much television, don't play extracurricular sport, don't have physically active employment. Everybody now works on, on, on a computer. And there is a range of labour-saving devices, which means we don't do physical activity or exercise. As I said, in the States, this is a, this is a bigger problem than we have over here. And what we need to do is to work to improve that. We know that if you look at the risk of death and activity, that if you increase your activity, your risk of death reduces. If you decrease your activity, your risk of death gets worse. This is, a, this is my favorite slide, which is why some of you would have seen it twice now. This is non-vigorous activity and mortality. This is non-vigorous physical activity or mortality. So if you're doing nothing and you increase your activity by 2.5 hours a week, not a day, a week, you can reduce your mortality by 19%. 19%. Now, I don't know how many people are paying a pension, but, you know, I'd be out there doing a bit more exercise. And, uh, increase it by seven hours a week and you reduce your mortality by 24%. And that's, that's not running marathons. That's, that, that's just increasing your activity. That's taking the stairs instead of the escalator. That's walking down the stairs instead of taking the lift. Makes a big difference. If you look at attributable factors for all death, we know about obesity, lots of stuff on obesity, stuff on smoking, government legislation, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes. But the biggest effect on death is low cardiorespiratory cardio fitness. This is the big problem we've got. And then again, if you look at death versus BMI, so BMI 27, 27 to 30, and greater than 30, if you're fit, you still have a lower chance of dying. Even if you're fat, if you're fit, you still have a, better, you still have a lower chance of dying early. So, we're all worrying about, well, maybe I'm speaking for myself. I'm worrying about getting older. This is the geriatric curve. Oh, that hasn't worked. That's the end of the geriatric curve. That should all be red. This, is, this area here is, is deficient survival. Okay? This is where somebody's having to come in and wipe your backside for you. This area at the end of this curve is where we don't want to be. And that's if you've got a high-risk lifestyle, or you're inactive, you're smoking. This is where you want to be. You want to be fit and then dying. <laughs> That's where you want to be. So the goal is to die young, but as late as possible. <laughs> so what are the benefits of physical activity? Well, reduces heart disease by 40%, lowers risk of stroke by 27%, reduces diabetes by 50%, Reduces blood pressure by almost 50%. Reduces mortality from breast cancer and recurrent breast cancer by 50%. So if you've had breast cancer, if you exercise, you can reduce the recurrence of that breast cancer by 50%. That's about the same as tamoxifen. You can reduce the development of Alzheimer's disease by a third. 
And we know that the big problems and, and the amount of money that has to be put into Alzheimer's disease. And it's effective as, at reducing depression as SSRIs. So, I haven't got long, so I'm going to try and do some big hits. So this is exercise versus angioplasty. Angioplasty, very good, very techy, um, very expensive. And this is event-free survival on patients who had angioplasty against patients who were exercised in stable angina. And the patients who exercised, who had stable angina, did better than the patients who had angioplasty after a year. They just exercised. They didn't have the machine that went bleep or anything. And if you look at the cost, I mean, this is 20 minutes a day on a circular gometer. So this is with a, a personal trainer. But it's still considerably cheaper than having the operation. And that, that is the same for peripheral uh, vascular disease as well. Look at uh, hip fractures in postmenopausal women. <coughs> Again, this, this is the, the nurse's health study. 61,000 women. This is not a small study. It's a straight line graph. The more you exercise, the less chance you have of <coughs> fracturing your hip. And as most of the orthopedic surgeons here know, fracturing your hip when you're elderly usually leads directly to the morgue. Well, not in everybody's case, but 55% drop. And this is uh, dementia. Exercising less than three times a week, exercising more than three times a week. You're, all, you're almost halving your risk of dementia. 40% risk. So, renal disease. The studies that show if you exercise when you're being dialyzed, because if you have dialysis, you're sitting, you're sitting in uh, a renal dialysis unit watching telly for a couple of hours a day, three times a week. If you sit in your renal unit and ride a bike, or use a hand bike, you can improve the figures on the dialysis by 25%. Now, renal dialysis costs £2 billion a year. If you can save 25% of that, that's a £500 million saving. Cancer, we talked about cancer, reduces the rate of cancer. Reduces the rate of colon cancer by 60%. Reduces the recurrence talked about, improves outcomes of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So if you exercise during your chemotherapy, there's a good chance that the chemotherapy will, one, be more effective, and two, you won't get so many side effects from the chemotherapy. And that's something we hope to explore with the Macmillan Centre at UCLH. Mental illness. Physical activity is useful in major mental illness. I'm talking about schizophrenia, bipolar disorders. And also, the, the, the problem with mental illness is that if you have mental illness and you're sitting around uh, having mental illness, you don't exercise and you smoke, and you don't die of your illness, you die of coronary artery disease. And as we know, physical activity is as effective as Prozac in mild depression. Going back to genetics, the GLUT4 protein and the GLUT4 gene uh, is responsible for getting glucose into the cells of the body. It's a very important uh, protein, particularly in type 2 diabetes. Physical activity switches on that gene. So genetically, we know, we're just, we, I, I told you, we're exercise monkeys. That's what we are. And when you exercise, you turn on these genes, which improves your diabetes. No drugs required. There's another gene, PGC1-alpha, which is known as a master regulator gene. It controls various things, including blood pressure uh, and cellular cholesterol and the development of diabetes. Again, this is another gene which is switched on by physical activity and exercise. So, exercise, you know, one drug, one disease cured. And we know diabetes, you take several drugs. And if you've got diabetes, you've probably got hypertension. If you've got hypertension, you're going to get your cholesterol-lowering drug because everybody does, don't they? And then if, you, if you're taking that and or you've got arthritis, you may have to take a non -steroidal. And if you're taking a non you're probably going to have to take a PPI. So, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One drug, one disease. One operation, I'm afraid, Faraz, one disease cured. Exercise. You can exercise and you can, sort, you can do all those things at the same time. You can affect all those diseases. So, physical activity is a major risk factor. It exists in every population. 
World Health Authority, the World Health Organization, in, in 2005, did a survey. 2% of the health resources across the world are spent on prevention. 98% are spent on trying to cure the diseases that have not been prevented. Mad. Okay. So exercise is underutilized. We know that. And we've talked about trying to improve the education of uh, doctors and all healthcare professionals. Physical activity is the major public health problem of our time. And you all have the answer. You have to be more active. Thank you very much. Mike, that's outstanding. Um, three great talks, last but not least. Um, Sir Clive Woodward really needs no introduction. Outstanding rugby player. One of the perks of sport is you get to meet your heroes. And one of the greats when I was watching rugby as I was growing up and learning the game. Uh, then master coach delivered the ultimate prize in terms of rugby and performance in 2003. And he's taken a few moments out from guiding the GB team to the Olympics as director of performance to come and speak to us this evening. Sir Clive Woodward. There you go. Thank you, Farrows, and, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can I just first of all say, Farrows, congratulations. It's a big, big day for you today, and, and it's been a tough road, but uh, a really significant day for sport in the opening of this uh, Institute of uh, Sport and Exercise and Health. So congratulations, and really well done. I know it's not been easy, but it's well worthwhile. So, so again, like the, the, my fellow speakers, I've, I've got eight, eight minutes. So I, I just really, um, and obviously we'll be answering some questions after, I just want to really just throw out a few, a few um, ideas about... Um, sport and this concept about creating champions and elite um, athletes. And I want to share with this just very quickly this, this kind of model I, I use, which um, which really is uh, something that I've uh, I've not learned, I've not studied, I've just generally picked up through experiences. First of all, a player, but more importantly, as a coach, in terms of what are the what are the ingredients that go into making this champion athlete? Is there something special you actually need? And I'm going to quickly just describe four people. And as I as I go through this, this is how I kind of work when I'm speaking to athletes and coaches and in, indeed people from the, the sports science world and exercise um, and, and health world. So this is the model I kind of use to describe this, this champion. And I'm going to describe four, four, four people pretty, pretty quickly, but please I'll obviously take questions afterwards. The first person we just described is someone called um, Talented. And if we use the, 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 the people in, in this room as an example, but you know, everyone in this room has to be talented. You wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, in, in, this, uh, in this university, unless you've got this talent to do your subject. Sport is no different. You know, I, I stand not in front of sports science world, but I stand in front of athletes, and the, the athletes I get to meet are talented. Um, and the, the key thing to talent is, um, the, the criteria I use, you've got the ability to do your job, and you've got the ability to play sport, and what, what I use on the right-hand side, you've got the skill to improve. But the kind of what I put out in, in a competitive world, and um, in terms of competitive world of sport, is that you know, we're sitting here with these talented athletes, um, and let's say we're the England rugby team. I'm sitting here with this incredible, talented group of play players. Um, but the people we're competing with, and let's say they're next door, you know, unfortunately next door, they've also got a very talented group of athletes. You know, they've got the New Zealand All Blacks, you've got the South Africans in that room, you've got the Australians, and dare I say the Welsh and the Scots and the Irish. You know, so everyone's got talent. So, you know, and, and talent comes in various areas, uh, which we're not going to kind of, kind of go go through, but to, in, in terms of understanding, you, you've got this talent. What, what I want to just quickly go through is what else you need on top of talent, which I really look for. And this is something when I first started kind of coaching and playing, I didn't really think about it. I just thought it was about talent and various things. So I'm going to describe three of the people I think you need on top of talent. Be very, very clear, you can't put someone in this room and make them in, an, an England rugby player or put them into your world unless you've got the talent to do the job. But if you're in a competitive environment, it's what else you need on top of your talent to actually leverage this to really become a, a champion or a, an Olympic gold gold medalist. And these are things I really, really look, look for. And what, sorry, when I'm speaking to, to kind of uh, athletes and coaches, that's, that's my favorite line. Talent alone is not enough. Talent gets you into rooms like this, gets you into sports teams. It certainly doesn't get you to win, win gold medals or rugby world cups. You need something on top of talent to actually get the job done. So three things I look for is first of all this concept that was called teachability and quite simply teachability is your ability to learn or take on knowledge and in my language you, you go from being someone I call talented you go above the red line and you get what, what I call a student 
So teachability, and quite simply, in my coaching language, and, and those of you who have worked in my, these are, these are the words I use, you're either a sponge or a rock. And quite simply, you've either got a sponge between your ears or you've got a rock between your ears. And you'll be amazed that the people who get to the top in sports, um, their knowledge of what they do is, is often equal or greater than that of the actual coach. And that's the greatest accolade you can pay the, the, the coach of the team or the coach of the athlete. Because when you think about it, when, you, when you're doing sport, um, how, how much of your sporting time is, is actually spent with your coach to the next year? Uh, I, I, almost every single sport I can think of is very, very li little. <coughs> so the key as a coach is to make sure when your athlete is practicing, the athlete is practicing the right things. There's absolutely no point in practicing uh, unless you're doing the right things. So the more you can put this knowledge into the player, the better they're going to practice, the more they can practice properly. You know, because there's this great saying, you know, about you know, practice makes perfect. Well, that's actually not very true. It's, to me, it's, it's knowledgeable practice or perfect practice makes perfect. You know, you've got to actually know what you're doing. And when you take this down a level to and those of you who've got kids or those of you involved with children, you know, and I really get in my kind of um, soapbox about this subject, I, I don't think we, we teach sport very well. And this is not just a, 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 uh, an issue in the UK. I think it's worldwide. In my job now, I'm able to go into Olympic sports all, all, all around the world. And I don't see anything different than the way we teach sport. And to me, when we, with the way we teach sport, you know, at least 25% of sports teaching should be in a classroom or a lecture room like this, where you're actually teaching. Teaching sport, rugby, cricket, football, boxing, whatever your sport is, is no different to me than teaching maths, history, English, you know, medicine. There's, 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 there's no difference. You've got to study it. And yes, we're lucky in sport. We spend a lot of time out there doing it, you know, on the, on the fields and, and in the pools and all these places. But unless you've got an academic side to it, a learning side, but in sport, you see, we don't do that. We just go out and play it. But the real top athletes, their knowledge of what they do is quite amazing. You, know, you look at someone like Chris Hoy, three gold medals in Beijing. We hope he'll deliver next month. When you sit down with Chris, incredibly talented athlete, but his knowledge of what he does is unbelievable. And the way he pushes his coaching teams is unbelievable. That's why he's the best in the world. So this concept about teachability is, is amazing. And what, what frustrates me a lot when I go around um, uh, sports, you, you kind of sit there, and most sports teams, when you, when you walk in, there's not a pen in sight, there's not a bit of paper in sight, no one's taking notes. You know, and I've never been to any lecture, any top businessman, anybody in top in your, your field, unless people are in there taking notes. Sport don't think they can do this. It's complete nonsense. So one of the things to do with the rugby team, you know, I completely changed this whole culture, and that's why I think we've got the job done. Because we're these very talented athletes, but, you know, we, we spent a lot of time in classrooms, a lot of time in kind of lecture theatres, learning, studying, them writing things down, them presenting back to us, almost like doing exams in it. So in terms of being an elite, elite sportsman, your knowledge of what you do has to be right up there with, you, with your coach, arguably greater than that of the coach. And I repeat, that's the biggest accolade you can pay the coach if you find an athlete with this incredible knowledge about everything he does. And of course, in your world, in terms of the you know, physiology and uh, sports science and all that sort of stuff, it's absolutely key. You can't just stand back. And what I train the, the athletes to do, you, know, you should be working with your sports science, with your exercise physiologists, to really understand why you're doing stuff. Not just do it because they say do it. You, know, you look at strength and conditioning, nutrition, all these areas of, of sport. This is all part of the learning process they, they've got to do. And if you've got this real champion person, they will normally take the barriers far higher than you can actually um, imagine. Because you're, you're just a coach. They know what, what limits they can actually take, take, to, take it to. So this teachability, being a sponge, not a rock, is absolutely massive. And there's nothing wrong with being a rock. But if you are being a rock, to me, you've just got to go below the red line and understand it's kind of fingers crossed approach. You know, the real champion people go above the line and become real, you know, e you know, real excellent to actually capture this knowledge and keep it themselves. <coughs> the third thing I look for on top of being a talented person um, is just this person who can play under pressure. Um, we speak about this a lot, and it's kind of one of my favourite sayings in sport. It's this very, and I call this person a warrior, sorry. If you, if you kind of got talent, you've got the ability to take on knowledge, uh, if you've got the ability to play under pressure, you become what I call a warrior. And the key thing, you're a very English term, this term called teacup, and quite simply teacup stands for thinking correctly under pressure, and the key word is correctly. I mean, everyone in this room, those, those of you who are involved in, you know, the Pharisees world doing operations, that's, that's what you do. But when, it, when, it's, so when you're under pressure in operations, it's how can you think correctly when all these things are actually happening. And when things don't go according to plan, that's when the real champion people in your world will also be thinking correctly under pressure. But we, we kind of really work on this. Because when you think of a sportsman or athletes, you know, when you think of these athletes in a few weeks' time, the pressure will be huge. 
and it's the people who can actually think correctly and not get phased by what's going on who will actually get the job done. And I, I firmly believe pressure is good. You know, I think pressure is fantastic because you've got to understand you're under pressure, also that person next to you is under pressure. And, this, and it's quite simple. You've got to make sure you've got some strategies in place and you coach this. And it is coachable. You know, be very, very clear. You're not born with this gene to play under pressure. It's something you can coach and something you can teach uh, people how to, how to actually do, do this. And I'll give you just one example of what, what, I, what, I've, what I kind of, kind of big on when, I, when I'm coaching, when I was coaching. I've never seen anyone else work, work this way. But if we go back to us being the England rugby team again, I'd always have on the wall three, three key things in any, any meeting room. And we had a lot of meetings, you know, be very clear. I think meetings are good. I read books about, you know, meetings and you shouldn't have meetings. I don't know how you operate without meetings. I think meetings are good as long as there's a clear time scale, a clear agenda. You know what you're trying to do. But in this meeting room, hence the classroom, this education about, you know, the players would come in and, you know, very clear, we're in the business of trying to win on Saturday. But on the wall, I'd always have three, three things. I'd always have a big clock. I have a big um, scoreboard, I have a big whiteboard with 30 players on 15 a side. In any meeting like this, I would just stop the meeting and some go Farrah's and I'd, I'd just go here. Okay, you know, clock, one minute to go. Scoreboard, um, South Africa 12, England 10. And then I'd set the situation up. And then I'd ask that player, Farrah's an example, to go to the board and immediately tell me what he would do in that situation. If he can't immediately tell me, that's what he would do. In other words, a minute to go in the game, with two points down, that's the situation. If he can't immediately tell me what to do, he's not a warrior. He's just a student of the game. And what warriors do, they think of every single possible um, thing that could happen. And when it happens, if you've actually thought it through, especially if you've documented it and studied it, when it happens, you've got a very high chance of getting through it and making the right decision or the correct decision, tea, tea cup. If you've not even thought about it before and you're there in the moment and things are all kicking off, which happens in sport and, and in your world, if you've got to think about it, and then you've got to just assume you're going to use your experience, the chances are that you're very high you'll make a wrong decision. So this teacup, thinking correctly in the decision, is massive for me. And we do lots of scenario after scenario after scenario, both individually and as a team. Because individually you've got to know how to operate, and as a team you've got to know how to operate. And these are the, be very, very clear, these are things you need on top of talent. So it's your ability to play and perform under pressure. And last thing, last one, um, how I define a champion or a champion or a a athlete is this, people have this incredible will um, and one of my favourite words in sport is, is people with the right attitude. Now attitude is something that I don't think you're necessarily born with. I think it's certainly developed but, you know, as you grow up through experiences with your, where, where you get to school and what actually happens in your life. But again, I think attitude, can, you can coach attitude. And, and what, I, what I do, and I'm not going to go through this because I've only got eight minutes and I've got about two to go. Um, I have ten definitions of attitude. So what I do, I define what attitude means to me in a sporting world. And I make these very detailed definitions. And quite simply, the people who are working with me, the athletes and coaches, we all work off that, that template. You can do you know, very sophisticated psychometric tests to measure these 10 attributes of attitude, but you don't actually need to do that because simply just do a bar graph and you measure how you measure up against um, att attitude. One of them, for example, is punctuality. I'm absolutely massive on punctuality. You know, how can you possibly trust or work with somebody? It says more about so. It says more about an individual or team than anything I can think of. So punctuality is huge. We put a huge store on punctuality because you just can't be late, and that reflects how we play the game and the whole thing. And you know, and you have a very, very clear definition of what that means and the whole thing. So you kind of measure someone's attitude. These things are are measurable. I so said you can do quite sophisticated tests on this, but you actually don't don't need to do that. So you measure measure those areas. So to me. It's quite, quite straightforward, you know, you've got to have this incredible talent, be very, very clear, you can't take people off the street. Um, but on top of that, you know, you've got to have that talent, just to summarise, you've got to have that, be very, very clear. Um, but everyone's got talent to a, to a different degree, and the, if you're reading at the elite sport level, you know, there's lots of talent all around the world. And so, but on top of that, what sets people apart, to me, is quite, quite straightforward. It's your ability to learn and take on knowledge and really push the boat out. I mean, I would, I would get on a plane tomorrow and fly to the far side of the world if it meant I had the slightest percentage chance of becoming a better coach. I would actually do that. Once you lose that passion, or your, your passion or hunger or thirst for knowledge, the chances are you'll just go below the red line and, and come second. And, and professional sport is not about coming second. And then the next thing is thinking. Thinking every possible scenario, teacup, pressure, and document this, study it, share it to the people. So when these things happen, you know, you can actually make the right, the right decision. I mean, the, the teacup thing is interesting because it must be massive in your world. You know, I've got three great kids, but if they're sitting here now, they're all 
fold the arms and cross the legs and go, oh, here he goes again, he's off in his teacup moment. Because that's simply, so we brought the kids up. You know, because they're out there, they're normal kids, they're out there doing all sorts of stuff that probably they shouldn't be doing, they're going to get in situations that you hope they won't, but they probably will do. And quite soon, that's how you, how, you, how you teach them, it's how they can think correctly in that situation and handle what actually happens to them. And so it's, it's, no, it's, no, it's no different at all. So it's just a very simple, practical way of working, but it kind of, kind of works. Um, and now they're kind of older, you get in sort of, you know, all sorts of messages and phone messages to have a look at this, not a very good teacup moment for this person, you know. So they kind of get it now. But at the time, they're going to go, oh my God, here he goes again. So, and just lastly, there's no substitute for hard work. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the, the key thing. So that's just briefly, I thought I'd just touch on those. Um, you know, I can literally spend a day on each of those subjects in terms of lecturing and breakout groups and real academic, academia on it all, all the side. But it kind of works. It kind of works. And when you see someone win, They've not just done it because they've got this natural God-given talent. I just don't believe that at all. I haven't seen it. You know, it's amazing what people do. Especially these people, we hear people called nat naturally gifted. You think of Usain Bolt and you think of all sorts of, um, you know, Messi in football. When you finally go down the scenes, you'll be staggered how hard they work, how, how much knowledge they've got, and they don't get to be the top just because they've got this incredible... They may come across that way in public, but behind the scenes, when you're lucky enough to see what they really do, you'll find that kind of model kind of kind of stacks stacks up. So so thank you very much. Well done again to Farrows. It's been a real pleasure to be here.